really time to get started. Welcome everyone to today's Tuesdays at two. I am your host, Antoinette LaGrosa. And if you are new to Schiller Learning, we are part of the nonprofit Rising Stars Foundation. And our goal is to help everyone get the benefit of a multi-sensory personalized education. And today here with us, we have a special guest, Joshua Zimmerman. Joshua, thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Josh is with Brown Dog Gadgets and he is going to share with us some awesome hands-on science kits that you know can be a um, be put together for a standalone science curriculum or work as a wonderful supplement to anything else. So Josh, welcome. And would you like to tell us a little bit about Brown Dog Gadgets? Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm here. I'm Josh uh, of Brown Dog Gadgets. Over to my side is Pete. So if I'm talking to somebody, it's just not myself. It's uh, Pete <laughs> is the one throwing up all the things up on the screen. And there's Pete. Oh, hi, Pete. Pete. Pete Cam, it's a, it's a rare day when you get the Pete Cam up and going. Uh, so I used to be a middle school science teacher. About uh, eight years ago, I left teaching to do this full time. Uh, and I really like doing science projects as a science teacher. I really hated doing all the other <laughs> teacher stuff. But I loved making science projects with my students. So I started kind of rolling that on my on my evenings and weekends into science kits um, that snowballed on me. And now we've got five full time people here. and a wonderful fake green screen background of bricks as oh, well. Oh, excellent. It, I love your brick background. I only, never would have known it was a green screen. I know. It's it's a very classy green screen background. One of the most classy backgrounds. Oh, thank, thanks, <laughs> Pete. I'm sure it doesn't look quite green to me. I'm colorblind, but uh, the solid background behind me. So we do a lot of hands-on science projects because back when I was a teacher, I really like projects my kids could be creative with, but also then take home with them. And that was a big sticking point in my classroom. So so many things I had were fun projects, but they had to be reused over and over again for the next group of seventh or eighth graders coming through, which I know is always a problem. And kids always seem to work much better when they can personalize something and have some ownership of it. And they can then take it home, show pride, show, show some enthusiasm for the thing they made, the thing they can show off to their grandma, grandpa, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, just look at this cool thing. And for learning, if they're more invested personally in a project, they're gonna work through any difficulties, just be more motivated to learn and to just, remember stuff. We always remember things when they're more interesting than when they're boring, especially long term with students. And so a lot of the things we do are kind of, I call them arts and crafts science projects, because they're really fairly arts and craftsy, your, your standard arts and crafts things, but with some electronics thrown in as well to make it very much STEM and STEAM, doing simple circuits, adding even simple programming to things so that they get that higher level than just doing a fun holiday craft project. They probably have done dozens of times in a school or at home or in a scout troop after school. Uh, yes. So we try to have a wide range of things that each of our kids can do because really they're craft supplies and then you choose a project you want to do with it. For instance, um, I'll hold up a, a card here, see how well it works the green screen. For like, the, like This is just a very standard greeting card. Yay. But we can we have dozens of different cards that you can do. And the insides are all very similar with some basic circuitry. This has just been sitting back here from the last workshop we did. Um, oh, green screen effect. Uh, but you can you can say take the like the same paper circuits kit and make dozens of different projects with it or design your own, which is what we always encourage teachers and students to do as well. But then again, that's why I have people like Pete and Andy, our curriculum writer, cranking out fun holiday projects galore because a lot of people just want to have their kids sit down and choose to make something, which is perfectly I fine. I saw that incredible list on your website of all the different projects that you can choose from once you're purchasing the set of materials. So yes, it's indeed. actually the paper circuits is one of the things that's on my Christmas list. I don't think my kids go on YouTube and watch the replays. So I think I can say this without spoiling the surprise. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's uh, always good. 
the, the paper circuits are definitely one of the things that is going to end up under our Christmas tree this year. <laughs> it does. I was going to say it has the widest range of uses um, just because you can, we call it paper circuits because most people do activities on paper. However, we do quite a few projects on felt, on fabric with the same materials because we use a nylon based um, tape. Actually, I'll grab a little roll here. Here's a, a big roll of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fabric tape. Really, it's, it's a, a string of nylon that's conductive. And so you can put onto a shirt or onto a piece of felt or make something fun and flexible with it, just as easy as you can with paper. So there's a lot of range you could do with it. And we've been leaning into a lot of the, the more soft, uh, felty projects for the holidays because so many things look better in felt for the holidays. It just seems a little right. more holiday appropriate if you make the same project out of felt as opposed to paper. And so many of the things we do are, are fun. Oh, I'll show some more of these off, but you know, this in paper, eh, but this in felt just seems a little more holiday-esque. And I'm always a big person when it comes to the feel, a tactile feel for students, because yes. having worked with kids, I know if we can make it more real, I, a little real quote unquote, because I've had middle school kids say, hey, this isn't real science because it was way too kitty in presentation. Although the difference between the thing they were doing and say just wires on a table, was literally the plastic enclosure things were in on the kitty version. It was the same circuit, same overall project. It's just, it's that look and feel for them that helps them feel more adult, especially as you get older yes. with the kids at middle school, high school level. And felt just gives a very different tactile and mental feel. You're doing something much different than paper. Paper is such low level for kids, but acrylic felt from Amazon <laughs> has a very different look and feel. We have uh, snap circuits. That's something that we've had for years. But it, in looking at your materials, like the crazy circuits, the paper circuits, the solar science station, it just felt like this is going to be the next step up beyond those type of beginner materials. And snap circuits is what I used my class from the start of my sixth graders with because it's a really great system. It's straightforward. It's hard to go wrong with it. But especially at that age, middle school age, and especially if a kid who is bright and on top of things and really rolling with it, they're, they're invested in it, they kind of move beyond it really, really, really quickly or want to go to that next level of projects they might see on YouTube or um, some of the DIY websites out there. So that's why we, our Lego-based crazy circuit system literally is just little parts on, on little circuit boards that pop onto Lego. I'll switch my overhead view in a second. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, it's the same stuff. And whether it's an LED and snap circuits or an LED on a piece of paper, an LED on, on a little circuit board for Lego, it's the same part. It's the same way it's hooked together. It's the same circuit diagram, diagram the same learning objective, the same experience, but just it's a different format. Heck, if I could use conductive thread and sew it onto a, a shirt, it's the same thing, just it's a different format. Again, it's finding that nice thing the kids are into, what, that relation. Some people love to make wearables, which is a really difficult thing to do because a big layer of sewing on top of it. But if that's what you're into, you can do it without much problem these days. And yeah, just the crazy circuit system was just taking that idea of like a simple project, but doing it on Lego. So they're making uh, circuits, literally circuit boards on a Lego environment. Uh, which I always find fun. I'm also a very visual learner. I like to good feel, a good visual, and having a circuit on a on a Lego board or on a piece of paper, I can, as especially as a teacher, can look at something like, hey, this is how you have it hooked together. It makes sense. It's a good parallel to a circuit diagram or a circuit board. Yes. And I'm I'm very anti alligator clip only because they're so overused. <laughs> And you get a big bundle of wires sitting there in uh, in a classroom is just horrible to troubleshoot as a as an educator. Like I have no idea what you did, just wires everywhere. Um, yeah. Now, with your experience <laughs> in the classroom, you know, are there areas in particular you said like being able to take things home, but other areas of improvement that you saw a need for in science education that inspired your kit? You know. Sure. Science education in general and homeschool science in particular. Sure. Well, the biggest thing for I've noticed with students, no matter where, we work with so many scouts, 4-H groups, after school programs, homeschool, uh, parents and co-ops. It's just such a wide range, but everyone seems to want something that the kids are invested in personally, that's engaging and high interest, but also has good parallels to real world things that are happening. Um, and that's why I always try to make sure our, our all the things we do have those kind of different connections. It's not just, 
you're not just making something fun to make it fun. You're also having, there's something you can connect it to at least one, at least one thing to connect it to. So there is a little bit of learning like, okay, if we're making a wearable, how can we connect that to modern day technology that's happening? Especially I, I go to wearables as a really easy example because it's so weird using conductive thread um, to make things or using the conductive tape um, on fabric. But there's so many, especially popular artists, uh, musicians, movies, TV shows where people are wearing technology. It's wearable technology, especially uh, music performance. Just tons of light up outfits, tons of choreographed stuff. And I always told my students like, hey, someone got paid a lot of money to design outfits that would communicate with each other, or at least to a, to a central hub that lit up in unison to go with whatever performer was performing and is you know fashion design and technology. Someone got paid good money to do that and to work with popular musicians uh, to design that and to work with them. And so that would be, a, I mean, somebody out there has a really cool job doing that, <laughs> making light up outfits. Uh, years ago, the Black Eyed Peas were in the Super Bowl, I think, and they had these amazing light up outfits. And I would show that to my students, that uh, YouTube video, because there was the re really cool ones they had. And then the background people behind them had some really cool stuff, but not as nice. And then of course the thousands of performers around them had very basic things, but like someone, it's a huge undertaking but design, technology, programming, uh, electronics. And, yeah, and your just, kids can get them there. <laughs> they can't, we, do, we actually have some sewing kits as well. We do um, uh, as well, but sewing is sewing's a tough one. I always try to tell people, sewing's great if you know how to sew. If you can sew a button on, there you go. But uh, it's a skill that not a lot of students have these days. And so it's a, another layer of learning. So I'm very much uh, trying to dissuade people. If kids don't have to sew, don't do it work up to it. Because again, my goal is to make sure the kids have a positive learning outcome and project outcome. And so I try to make really good directions for our stuff, make YouTube videos, they're nicely produced. Uh, we have Karen in today. Karen is one of our one of our video people. She's over like in the other part of our studio back here uh, doing some big directions. Sorry, our, our overhead heater kicked on in our, our warehouse here. Uh, if you can hear a sound back there, it's right above me. Uh, it's but, not picking up. <laughs> oh, good. Well, we always worry about that too, because uh, yeah. But we do try and to make a lot of- would not want you to be cold. <laughs> uh, Wisconsin in winter, go figure. Uh, uh, but it's, yeah, trying to make sure the resources are there so that even if you're a, a parent or an educator or a scout leader who's never done this stuff before, which is a big barrier as well. That's something as, as well we've learned from working with educators across the board uh, and parents and students, you have to get the adult facilitator up to speed just enough so they can run the activity and help troubleshoot a bit, which is not always an easy task. Back when I was a teacher, I had a, a third grade teacher I worked with who was supposed to do electronics in third grade. I said, hey, I'm a new teacher here. What are you doing with your third grades for electronics? And she'd been there a few years. She says, oh, we just skipped that. I don't really get electronics. Oh. And, and I, I kind of looked at her like in my sarcastic Josh kind of way. I was like, <laughs> well, it's a good thing you understand math. Otherwise, those kids are going to have a really tough time. And she's kind of glared at me back. I'm like, you, you skipped a subject. No wonder my sixth graders I was teaching didn't like, they knew nothing. They had, so like starting basics. from scratch. But then again, I blame her, but also don't blame her. It wasn't something she was familiar with. Maybe she did like something in sixth grade herself and it had been 15 years for her. Um, but getting the adults up to speed is a big part of it so that they don't feel overwhelmed. Because I know so many adults shy away from doing anything high tech quote unquote, mm. because it's something new they have to learn, especially educators or an overwhelmed parent or scout leader. They're not going to spend three or four hours learning a new skill set yes. to do a half an hour activity with their kids. It's just not what they not would practical. do. practical. Yep. And so I sometimes say, sometimes for us as a business, we have to, we have to make the activities fun for the kids, but also easy enough for the parents <laughs> or the, the teachers can actually facilitate it. Because I found so many times the kids are better than the adults. So they're like, oh no, this is easy. We got it. Or they'll work through it because it looks fun, um, but adults just don't want to do it. And I totally get that as a, as a parent and as an adult and somebody who's run activities. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to spend the time to learn that. I don't have too much to do already. Uh, and but, you so. said that you have an overhead with some yes, activities. Pete. Which, which ones were you going to share with us? Well, we're going to show off a couple of things because this is the holiday season and um, holi we, we joke quarter four, which is October, November, December is our favorite time of year because so many holidays and just the season in general, let us light things up, which makes it really easy for us to make projects. Um, trying to put together a project in like March is just like, oh, there's nothing in March that really lights up. Um, but October, November, December, 
Those are fun. So we're going to go over a couple little activities. And Pete's actually going to walk over. He's got a few that we just put together. Literally, we're cranking out new things every day right now because it's that time of year. So one of my favorite things to do is to make some fun projects like this out of felt, as I mentioned before, because paper crafts are easy. Here's a simple, a simple Thanksgiving one we did before. And here's a couple other cards we did as well last year, actually. Pete over here. Oh, thanks, Pete. Um, just we have a whole bunch of different ones as well because we get a lot of requests from um, librarians especially who have a very diverse group of kids that will come into their library. So we try to make a bunch of very uh, just hol open holiday things, just generic holiday, as well as for specific religious holidays as well. Uh, so we just have a little bit of everything for everybody to meet their needs. And like Thanksgiving, even if you're not a turkey person, get behind a gigantic pumpkin in an old timey uh, pickup truck. But these I read the inside. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Pete says read the inside because he made this. No. <laughs> oh, and he made it. Oh, there's a ton to be thankful <laughs> for. Oh, that's that is classic Andy. Uh, I like a, it. The big pumpkin. It's and Andy so that, and the giant pumpkin. It, is that one of the things that you're able to download and print yes. from your website? Okay. So these are some different. Everything I'll show you here are things that are on our website. A huge table full of different things from workshops we've done. We always have a couple different versions of these. They have like a color version if you want to be an adult and be lazy and give somebody a card that's already colored, but also a black and white version because we know um, adding a little bit of kid coloring time into a project really increases the amount of ownership and um, just personalization they can have for it. It's, it's a weird thing. A little bit of coloring really improves um, the end user um, output, just the, the feeling, their satisfaction by just a little bit of coloring, because now it's yours. I made a blue pickup truck as opposed to a, a black pickup truck. My pumpkin was white because I like white pumpkins. I oh, got white pumpkins in my... So, I do too. <laughs> yeah, being able to color things uh, is just a really simple thing that just adds a little that little bit of extra flavor to it that little personalization it cannot I cannot tell you how weird it is just those little things you pick up doing this over the past 10 years are just that things that just improve someone's experience in a project like just a little bit of coloring it's it's a it's a really weird like psychological thing that we've had to learn so we've got stuff like this and these other cards all these cards are, and the, are, are very the similar lights format. from the snap circuit kit oh they're from our paper circuits kit oh which is oh right they're here. also from the paper circuits okay yes all, so like the paper circuits kits you can do any of the any of the paper circuits things I show right here because a big pile of them you brought over are just it's LEDs uh, are nylon tape and uh, a battery. Um, so usually a max of two LEDs we do, but this is our small paper circuits kit here, which has LEDs, tape, batteries, um, binder clips as well. We use some of those as switches or to hold batteries in place in some projects. Um, so let me grab a couple more of these guys. Paper circuits kit. And they come in these really nice little, uh, little plastic boxes because I love when people can put things back into a box for later. <laughs> yeah, so that the next time you want to use it, all of the materials are exactly where they need to be. Actually, this is an example I did in the workshop um, the other week. We were just showing out some simple holiday projects. This is just the nylon tape on um, on a cheap stocking we got off Amazon, <laughs> um, which is just fabric tape on fabric. Very simple. Uh, if I had a battery in the back, it would light these guys up in some fun green. Uh, but let's go over some of these other holiday ones I have to the side over here. Thanks, Pete, for bringing those over. So Pete has been doing something for us lately, making a bunch of fun standalone little little projects like Danny the Elf. And what, who is Danny named after, Pete? Danny Elfman. Danny Elfman, the composer who has composed many a, a soundtrack to a movie. But Danny the Elf, man. Um, so these are things that we've been kind of putting around both as a paper project but also as something that could easily be done in felt. So these are very simple, very simple cutouts, but we get a lot of requests for these. So we figured we'd put a few of these out this year, but just a very simple circuit on the backside, very simple project, cut color, something that a kid could sit down and do in 20, 30 minutes without a problem. Okay. And then hang up on a, on a Christmas tree, on a wall, pin it to a cork board. Or give a whole us punch. a gift to grandparents or aunts Ex and uncles. <laughs> hole punch the top, put a piece of string through it, hang it up somewhere. Just easy, very arts and craftsy holiday stuff. And Pete's done so many of these. Here's another one as well. Here's a fun Reginald the reindeer. And, and be able to impress home, homeschool skeptic relatives with the uh, electronic gift that your child has built. <laughs> exactly. 
and they're just yeah and very we're hoping to, again for that high interest level for the students as well because these are fun holiday you know it's very actually standard holiday crafts doing a a drawing project you cut out on paper but with some leds thrown in we do a lot of uh, a lot of reindeer-esque things this time of year with schools and after school programs because it's a very simple very fun kid project this one right here same thing just conductive tape on the back side led here but this is just a paper, one of our paper projects done out of felt. And again, just different. Always use it, stiff felt. Stiff felt is better than the, the thin stuff. You'd be surprised yes. that the different qualities of felt, um, things you didn't learn, uh, <laughs> I've learned I, over the years. <laughs> I am a felt connoisseur. I am very familiar with the wide uh, differences. in, in uh, my, my favorite of the ones Pete has done here is the very enthusiastic dancing gingerbread person. Um, gingerbread Jean. Really, that's the name we went with, Pete? Yeah, it is, yeah. Gene. You know, like it. I like it. It's great. <laughs> I, uh, I love, I'm a fan of alliteration, so I like these names. <laughs> me, me too. Uh, and so, again, it's, actually, I think the circuit on all of these is identical, um, but it's the, what they go on to. So, again, the, if you have a paper circuits kit, you can choose which of these things you want to do, print out, cut things out, freehand well, it. And you mentioned it would be like a 20 to 30 minute project. What age range would it be a 20 to 30 minute project for? So typically like these kind of paper circuits activities, we kind of see in that like fourth grade age level up to probably sixth, seventh grade, because they're the ones that would be most interested in a paper craft things. Eighth graders having taught eighth graders and they, they're, they're an interesting group of, of young people. Uh, this would not fly with them very well. They, they would probably look at it and then look at me and then just shake their head. Oh. I'm not uh, sure. Gingerbread Dean there uh, with his dance moves might be even popular with an eighth grader. I, I would hope so. I just, it was always, there's always, you know, some of my students were always into things and others just like, eh. um, so we, we try a lot of weird things out. Um, but uh, I, that fourth through seventh grade is kind of that optimal age range where they could put it together. And again, it depends on how much effort you put into decorating these things. If you're somebody who wants to spend, you know, 20 minutes decorating something, you totally could. Um, the circuitry on the backside should probably take five minutes to do for a, a newbie on this kind of thing. But again, okay. the decorating adds a lot to it. It's kind of um, kind of like Christmas cookies in a way. Um, you can spend way more time doing the decorating than you ever did baking them. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, or the actual process, you know, making the mix up and whatnot and putting it yeah. in the oven. So that's kind of where that extra time and that ownership comes from because if you want to give your gingerbread person here a very fun holiday beard or a fun festive... 1970s hat of some sort you could there's no reason not to so personalize these guys up is always fun maracas pete suggested maracas a tambourine, a tambourine? You, know, you can make a whole band of these little and guys for the newbie parent who is not familiar with the electronics and circuitry uh, what kind of instruction are you including into that kit? Ah, well, we see, for instance, the gingerbread gene here. We have some printed directions up here. And on the back side, we have step-by-step -step little directions here, a nice diagram on the back of the cutout. So you really just need to print this puppy out. Now, a lot of our things do have some step-by-step -step video directions as well. The more complex the project, the more directions we have. Some of the very complicated things um, have a step-by-step -step picture and a video as well as this kind of thing. But these right here are very much Okay, designed. so to build that circuit, it's just those bullets on the back there. That's it. Correct. And this is one of the more simple things to do, and which is why we have the nice diagram on here too, because mm -hmm. we find a lot of, especially a lot of students will not even look at the words, which is fun. T educators, especially adults in general, adults will overly fixate on words. We found doing enough teaching conferences and events with adults, they fixate on words like hyper focus. It's really weird. Um, whereas kids are just like, oh, that's how you do it. And they just do it. And they're done in pretty lickety split where adults are like, what do you mean by is in step four? <laughs> right, <What>, yes. <laughs> what, what is the long leg? Is it long? Uh, there's only two legs on the LED. One's long, one short. Uh, it's really funny. Librarians are, are the best. They, they really, they, 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 you think they could read. Um, no. <laughs> well, and that's in Montessori, it's the approach is very limited instruction and you want to show the child as opposed to tell the child. So this exactly. very much fits in with that. <laughs> And again, my big thing is too, is if you're a, a young person who's like, oh, that's all it is, 
But if you kids like, oh, that was easy. I'm like, great, now make your own thing. Design something on your own. Do your own project, which is always a big thing for us is once you get the basics, go design something. Go mess around and and do do your own thing with, uh, the, with the materials involved because that's always way more fun than the cookie cutter approach, so to speak, is when you can do your own design from scratch, which is a very high level of learning, synthesizing information, then doing something unique and new. Uh, of your own, which is a great place to be if you're teaching. Like, look, you've learned enough. You can make your own thing on your own without me involved, um, which I like. And yeah. homeschoolers statistically are um, more likely to become entrepreneurs than the population at large. And so, you know, that type of uh, incentive seems to be natural just in the, those independent learners that you have in homeschooling. And so that's where that learning circuitry and solar technology uh, can be really great foundational skills to give so that they can become entrepreneurs and create wearables, like you were saying, at homeschool conferences. Uh, a lot of them have booths for young entrepreneurs, kids who are creating and selling things. So I can absolutely see these ending up in finished products that young entrepreneurs are selling. Well, and like the sewing thing was interesting. Again, so sewing is one of those weird things where some people are really into it, some are not. Um, having done a couple of homeschool events over the years, it was interesting the number of parents that came up and said, hey, we already taught our kids how to do sewing this year. Um, and so we want to add on to that to make it another level of interest for them. Making a shirt, and eh, making a let up shirt. That is fantastic. And so like our sewing, uh, these are our Lego compatible parts. They work really well for sewing with conductive thread. And it's really simple sewing when it comes down to it. Um, but it's that extra layer of, of taking that skill set of learning how to stitch and then sewing on specialized buttons in a certain way, following the diagram, our video, our step-by-step -step directions, and then say taking that and making a light-up shirt for the holidays, an ugly holiday shirt, which is, is always and fun. Hand um, stitching is also something that is pretty common in a Montessori education, yep. that hand stitching is taught to teach the fine motor skills. And it's, it's a good one to do, and but it's just it's that a skill that not everyone does. And so we like to make sure we have, a, again, the wide range of things because I'm a lazy person when it comes to making wearables. Um, whereas my, my wonderful spouse, she is not. She spends a lot of time on her projects as her adult after hours hobby is doing some fun sewing projects. I'm just like, nope, I'm going to use some tape to put an LED on a reindeer nose and call it a day in two minutes. She'll spend hours sewing stuff onto a shirt, very complicated wise. It looks really great, but... Uh, way more time than I want to invest for me. But again, it's that layers of what works for somebody who's doing it and what works for the project that you're doing and the outcome and, or budget as well for things like paper circuits per project, much less uh, pricey than say doing what paper circuits, the cheapest thing you can do STEM wise with kids with the okay. widest range of things at the cheapest price point per project, where sewing was more because you're paying for the more little circuit boards. Uh, but you can always take these parts off and use them over and over again, whereas your paper circus materials, eh, they're kind of disposable. Um, okay. Grab another. So besides paper circuits, we also have another thing called origami circuits, which is actually using um, self-sticking vibrating motors. Actually, I have a little motor right here in my box of video supplies. So it's actually almost identical to our paper circuits. We swap out a bunch of LEDs for these little self-sticking motors. or just little peel and stick motors. So you can make three-dimensional paper craft projects that vibrate as opposed to just lining up. So you can do add another layer of complexity to the activities. Let me grab one from over here. This is a, this is a little, <laughs> it's a little police box if you're a Doctor Who fan, uh, it's from Doctor Who. But uh, we just have a, this little self-sticking motor on the inside. And we made a nice little three-dimensional design. It's a project we have on our website, just a little, oh, thanks. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. Uh, three-dimensional design. You can just add things to the outside, a very paper doll type approach, um, but then add LEDs and add the vibrating motor. So then it vibrates around and looks kind of silly. One of our favorite ones, which I don't have over here, um, but it's it's a little Roomba, essentially. It's a little hockey puck shaped okay. Roomba with a blinking LED on it. The vibrating motor vibrates around. But again, just adding another layer of complexity to the crafting more than anything. Oh, thanks, Pete. Pete's so great. But yeah, here we go. Here's one from workshops ages ago. But this one we just printed off. You can color them in, which is <laughs> we're lazy when it comes to workshop coloring. Um, but 
the electronics is simple, no more really difficult than the cards we're doing, but the crafting is that extra layer higher, which would make it more appropriate for the more advanced students, kids who are more crafty with their hands, so to speak. But again, it's high interest, it does something, and mm -hmm. it's fairly inexpensive um, per project to do. But again, that layer of complexity uh, design-wise really adds to the, the learning and the hands-on activity of it all. Um, Pete, would you grab me a science station? Sure. I'm sorry, it's the one thing we don't have over here. I think we just did a whole bunch of photography and video. Um, is that the solar station? Yeah, the solar science station, which has become, oh. it's something we've had for ages, but it, it has become weirdly popular this past year. The pandemic has really changed what we've been selling. Uh, mm. We have a wide, since we have a wide range of things, it just shifted from, from our one area to the other, which is great. Thanks, Pete. Sure. So we, we put this together because um, I like solar. We actually got to start doing a lot of solar projects, which have not been as popular the last couple of years, except for this guy, which keeps increasing in popularity. This is a little solar data collecting project, great for a science fair project, or if somebody wants to do a wide range of solar activities at home or in a classroom. So this is all put together with a screwdriver. Um, there's a little tiny... Uh, terminal block, which is a little screw port. You plug wires and screw it into place. Um, but this on here has a little solar panel, a little voltmeter, which if we were outside would tell us how many volts of power this panel was getting, depending on how sunny it is. A little USB port because kids really, USB is what their life runs on. All their gadgets and gizmos work off USB. It's just a standardized power source. Um, but we can plug in a phone or other device here and get a little bit of a charge off of it. Not super useful, but enough to show that yes, you can do it. And we have a couple little ports here you can just alligator clip onto or plug other things into to say run a fan or hook multiple science stations together, which we do in okay. some of the workshops we have to uh, show like, look, we hook them together different ways. We get a higher output from our panels. But this is a great little activity where you can use this multiple days in a row, get different readings, different times of day. And when I advise people <laughs> at certain times of year, you get lots of phone calls about doing science fair projects. I even have a big write-up on how to use this appropriately for a science fair. But you take different readings at different uh, angles here, 0, 45, 90, in different directions, north, south, east, west, and basically collect a ton of data. I'm that teacher that loved having kids collect a bunch of data and put into a chart because that's like high level science stuff. So all just data collection and then a data analysis. Um, but good collections, good charts and graphs are the core of that. Uh, but having you know kids, okay, go on, let's go outside and find out what's the optimal position for a panel to be in, which is a great real world situation to have the kids observe. So you say, okay, north, south, east, and west, different angles, different times of day, just basically collect spend five minutes every hour during the course of your day and collect that information, then come to a conclusion on your own. What's the best position to get the most output throughout the course of the day? And if you're an adult, you just Google it and find that 45 degrees pointing south, if you're in the Northern hemisphere, is a pretty good place to be. For kids, they can look at that information and say, okay, what works best based on my readings? Or if my readings are weird, why is it? Was one day cloudy? Was one day not cloudy? What's going on? But so that's a really very simple project to put together with a very wide range of use and also a good little screwdriver project as well. Nice little. Yes. Uh, but this is a nice one to use. And oh, now, now if, if you were to plug a phone in and keep that outside, could it charge a phone? So the answer is yes, with a big asterisk. Yes, it will get a charge. <laughs> However, the amount of power it's putting out to the phone is less power than the phone is using at any given moment. Okay. So you're, yeah, you're, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's a good demo activity of what you can do. Smaller, like smaller USB devices. Um, a lot of times people might have like a USB light or fan. We used to use a little USB fan with this as a demo um, at events or from workshops we ran just because it was a very instant, the fan turn, you saw it was doing something, but it wasn't okay. a lot of power. Gotcha. Uh, but your phone will like switch to charging, but it won't do anything because <laughs> it's just, okay. it's such a small amount of power. I will say this, in the 10 years I've been doing this and doing solar USB projects was something we've been doing since the beginning. Um, phones have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And my panels have remained the same size. <laughs> so uh, it's a bigger swimming pool I'm trying to fill up with the same size bucket um, is my analogy I use all the time. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's like, yep, yeah, well, it's doing something, just 
not on your gigantic, huge tablet-esque phone you have these days, but it's there so the kids can see that, yes, you can have a practical use from solar power to this. Um, and USB is just a very nice common power source that students are used to, because whether it's a, your portable game system, your cell phone, pretty much any device you take around with you, heck, a Fitbit is charged off USB. Everything runs off a USB 5 volt power supply, which is just really funky in the past 20 years, how it's gone from being keyboards and mice to being the go-to like power plug-in supply for everything we use that travels in our pocket, um, which is just very silly and interesting. Uh, but this is a nice little project that really, I designed this for like fifth grade on up. As if a student is just pretty good with their hands, it's not tough, it's screwdriver based. Uh, we have again video diagrams, all that fun stuff galore, and uh, lesson plans for this as well that are great for either home use or uh, in, in a classroom environment. That's very much student led. Uh, most of the stuff we do is very much student led because I like when the kids can do all the work themselves. I was that kind of teacher, like, great, here's the stuff, here's this, the things. I will sit over here if you need help with the activity, come ask me a question. But otherwise, you guys do all the work because then you're learning if you're doing the work yourself. If I'm doing the work, uh, I already know what and I'm doing. <laughs> in a Montessori style homeschool setup, the materials would be placed into a tray and onto the shelf. And when the child feels moved, they can go grab that and um, pull it off, do the activity. And like you said, just request to help if needed. So I always have to recommend to anybody who's watching this still, uh, if you're still here listening to me, I recommend the go to activity for anybody at home who wants to do some very fun, just science stuff, especially electronics with kids, is making a penny battery. Uh, I can't tell you how many people are like, I want to do a lemon or a potato battery. No, 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 no. Don't spend money on produce, especially lemons and limes. That gets expensive quickly for citrus. I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like spending all my money on limes I'm not going to use for cooking. You know, uh, <laughs> but if you use uh, pennies and then zinc washers, you have your copper and your zinc uh, galvanized washers from, say, a Home Depot or a Lowe's. Um, you got your copper and your zinc, and then you just take a like a piece of cardboard and cut out little circles, and then dip that in vinegar. You have your electrolytes, so those three together give you like about a half a volt of power. And you stack enough of those together, you get basically the output of this battery here, and can light up an LED. Five or six little stacks of those, and it's a really great way to like look. You made a battery. You made each of these little cell put enough together. You've made a chemical battery. That's a very horrible chemical battery but it will light up a red LED just a little bit, enough that you can see it's working, where you can measure it with a multimeter and it costs basically a dollar's worth of materials, vinegar, cardboard, pennies, and washers, then an LED. Um, and it's a really great activity that's really fun to do uh, with students. And I used to love doing that as one of our first opening projects in a science class, uh, like my science year, as a let's follow directions and have a fun outcome. And there you go, you've made a, you've made a battery out of, that, that sounds produce. like a great project. And lemons and limes would take so many lemons and limes to do that. It's just, it's too many or potatoes. It, it gets, it's weird. You, know, you ever have any luck, Pete, with, uh, with citrus or potato batteries? I haven't really done them for oh. so long. It's been a while. Yeah. Eh, no. nah, uh, pennies, washers, and, uh, yeah. and vinegar soaked cardboard. Uh, and my classroom, we do you know groups of two and everyone would have success. It was rare to have someone who just biffed it horribly. But then again, you just read you a stack of stuff and you're fine. There's, there's no downside um, to that activity. But that's a really good one I was gonna throw out there. Like, it's easy, just Google it. It's so simple, just have fun. Especially if you have LEDs from say a paper circuits kit you could use. Uh, it's a good way to have a, a fun afternoon project. I did that with uh, fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth graders and would just have deeper questions or have them use them for different things depending on the age level involved. Um, let's try to power some different motors, see which of these will work. How many will it take to power a motor? How could, anyway, not to go too far into things, but uh, that's a really fun activity, uh, which we don't sell, uh, which just is a very easy thing to do, which is fun for anybody, because you probably might just have to go get some washers or pennies. Um, so, and you're, and you're good on that. So, yeah, um, I, hey. I just put that on my list of things to do. <laughs> uh, Pete dropped over to here, uh, when I was talking about 3D things. Andy, our curriculum writer, has been big into these, um, we, we call them tubes. They're, they're based off toilet paper tubes, toilet paper rolls, um, but different tube creations, which either have an LED on them or vibrate around. These are all vibration-based, uh, but as an arts and crafts project that 
is a three-dimensional, very simple thing. Uh, he's just been cranking these out for Halloween, Thanksgiving, and then winter holiday stuff. Uh, but these are another like fun little three-dimensional thing. Oh, and a cranberry. He made oh, a, very a, cute. a vibrating cranberry can because we're in Wisconsin and there's lots of cranberries. Um, but it's just a, a oh, vibrating motor. Oh, you're gonna work for me. Oh, you will work for me. Maybe you. It's a vibrating kids, can. Of... Kids love to make things move. Yes, and um, the one thing. Oh, I guess I don't have any over here. Oh, yeah, we do. One of the our most popular thing we've been selling over the years have been um, probably the most silly thing when I think about it. Um, I actually have one over here. I'll grab one. There we go. And so once you get your paper circuit or your crazy circuit kit, then at your website, there's just a whole selection of projects that you can download for no additional cost. No, no, we put, we put all of our directions and resources on our website, whether or not you buy our products, um, mainly because you want to make sure people, especially educators or parents, can take a look at what we have and say, hey, I want to make XYZ project. What do you have or this type of activity? They can look at our resources, they can evaluate and say, hey, these are good resources. These are not good resources. Um, I really like to be open about what we have out there. Nothing's worse than buying a kit and finding your resources are horrible. Uh, the directions are horrible for things. We've all been there buying something like these directions are, are a mess. Um, uh, or that I can't even begin to understand this. <laughs> Uh, we just got a brand new laser cutter in our office, replacing our one we've had for the past eight years. It's a great machine. The directions are pretty much non-existent. So we're back there fiddling with every setting in the software trying to make things work appropriately because directions are bad uh, for it. <laughs> so but we always think about directions because again, the adults involved need to be uh, well-versed enough to run the activity appropriately for kids, especially help troubleshoot things. And a lot of that helps just us having good directions. This right here is our, our, our bread and butter of our business. It's a toothbrush robot. Literally, it's a toothbrush head, uh, a vibrating motor, and a battery. This is a bristle bot. And this is a very oh. simple vibrating project. Oh, if you'll stay in place. He zips around. They're easy. They're really easy to make. They're hard to do what you want them to do, which is the point. Uh, getting kids to do challenges with them are great. We've been doing these since the beginning. This is one of the first things in my classroom ages ago, back when I taught fourth grade briefly. Um, and back when I used to cut toothbrush heads uh, off of their, their stems, now we get our own injection molded for us. Oh yes, our own custom toothbrush head. That's a, <laughs> the height of my professional life is we get our own toothbrush heads made. Um, but we do go through so many of these, but these are just nice little fun activities that are pretty quick and easy to put together. Uh, and they're just instant fun. And then of course you wanna do the engineering stuff with it too, you totally can. Or you can just have something that vibrates around in a silly way and they're pretty much impossible to do wrong. Um, and they're, they're great stocking stuffers. And on the similar note, we have this guy here, which is our solar bug with a bunch of different designs for these. But essentially it's a solar panel with a vibrating motor on it. And in the sun, it'll vibrate around, but you can make a fun stag beetle or a ladybug or a stink bug or my favorite. Very neat crab. and slightly creepy. <laughs> well, kids like bugs and we have a lot, large number of bugs. You can design your bug and it's a good solar activity as well because it's, very simple solar activity for say your, your nine or 10 year old who isn't gonna be able mm -hmm. to make the science station, but they can put this together and walk down the sun and to see it works instantly. You can compare this to um, having a hand over it, not having a hand over it, having different materials put over the top of it as well. Um, different types of light sources. Like right here, we have a bunch of LED lights and some fluorescence up above. It's not working because these are not good light sources, good right. visible, but not good for other types of light. Um, so the, the oh, stag he, he's a, beetle. He has a whole video, by the way, too, he said. <laughs> oh, stag oh, he wants beetle. I, I was, too, I never was, knew what a stag beetle was. I'd never seen them, never heard of them until I saw one in my child's bedroom, like a real one. <laughs> and I was so freaked out by this giant uh, bug. And then, yes, researched and found out the what a stag beetle was and very interesting, but they are large, scary bugs. <laughs> they, they are. I found one in my basement this summer, but they're pretty benign insects. As a, they like, they're just kind of like, just do their thing. Then it really bothered people. Um, they're they're kind of silly. Very intimidating looking. <laughs> uh, Pete's going to show a video of these guys in action because they're very lame otherwise. Uh, just sitting okay. Here. See it? Oh, very neat. So that's just a bunch, a bunch of them on a piece of plastic. <laughs> 
a piece of uh, just acrylic we had, and it's just out in our front of our office there with a bunch of different bugs. Some of them have legs because we put legs on them, but they they vibrate pretty well on the sun. It's a nice activity that one never runs out of power because it's all solar power based. Thanks, Pete. Um, <laughs> so yeah, never runs out of uh, out of out of battery power because it's always powered by the sun. Uh, but it's a really nice uh, cause and effect basic demo of solar uh, energy in a format that is high, again, high interest, entirely student led with a little bit of personalization because you got your bug. And the kits we have um, have a bunch of different bodies you can choose from. So I, I'm always a fan of the ladybug because I am a lazy cutter. I can easily cut that shape out. <laughs> Whereas this is a little more complicated shape. Uh, what do we have like eight different shapes, Pete? Yeah, I think there's, at least eight. there's at least eight. We have legs as well and wings. Um, we can make a big butterfly or big dragonfly with wings. That's a lot of cutting. Um, the ladybug and stag beetle are the, are the two favorites we tend to see uh, people use when they send us pictures or, or videos. Uh, but this is a fun little activity, basically a solar powered version of this um, that never runs out of energy. But yeah, the solar bug is fun um, to do for things. Um, so yeah, this, those, those, I think we've gone through pretty much every single like arts and craftsy um, project thing we've done um, for, for the stuff that we we create. The only thing we haven't really shown off is our Lego based circuitry stuff, but uh, if you if you want, we can show a couple of those things off too. Oh sure, absolutely. Uh, well, because I'm... those are actually the three things on my gift list: the paper circuits, the crazy circuits, and the uh, solar science station. <laughs> actually, I have to say, but, Pete, would you go oh, grab a couple of those? Although uh, now I'm thinking of adding the uh, the bug. <laughs> well. Uh, I like when I can make sure I have projects like the bug or the bristle bot, which are very straightforward. It's going to be impossible for a kid not to make it the right way or like the solar bug. It's, it's hard to, to mess it up. So this is just, you're going to have it completed. You're going to have that, that engagement level, that high interest of, mm -hmm. of I, I made this, I did this. It's fun. It's engaging. And it's, it's, it's them uh, as a, some of them, you know, some of the bigger paper craft things take some time to do. This takes a little bit of effort if you're, you know, 12 years old to do. But the bug is again just different. Um, oh, thanks, Pete. Oh, these, these will do. These, these will do just fine. We have some bigger things up. We again grabbing things off of our big and photography then, table. If anyone has any questions for Joshua, please do go ahead and pop those into the chat. Sure. And either I will respond or Pete has been happy to throw out little messages as well. Um, so this is our Lego based circuitry stuff. This is one of the more complicated things. This is our, one of our big demos that we, we here, actually I can plug it in because I've got a power cord right here. Don't I Pete? Oh, other way. This is a big demo we, we use every now and then to, for, for stuff where uh, this is a micro bit for it's a little programmable board. They're pretty popular. If you're ever in the, the need of a fun, very straightforward programming platform, the micro bit is superb for a new learner. It's a very good drag and drop visual interface, tons and tons and tons and tons of projects, lots of built-in features, but we use it as like a, as a central spot to work off of to add more things in the mix, such as our LEDs and each of these buttons just do a different, different thing. I know most people that end up purchasing our stuff uh, do not do um, the programming aspect. They do the simple circuitry aspect, which is just batteries, LEDs, buttons, switches, those kind of things on Lego. But this is a good example of essentially making a circuit board on Lego using that same nylon tape we use for paper circuits, just an eighth inch version. And this would literally use a circuit board just on a, in a brick based environment. Um, and we do a more simple version of this kind of stuff. It's great Oops. to show the parallel between an actual physical circuit board, what you do on here, and then a circuit diagram because it's it's the same same kind of components the same hookup the same traces on a board but just tape on on a brick environment and all this stuff is pretty easy and very reusable things just pop on and off but the nice part about this is as an educator is kids have to hook up things together the right way there's only one way to hook up an led in this the same way there's only one way to hook up an led inside of a a circuit board or a paper circuit activity it has to be in a certain way to work. So they are learning how things hook together, how things work together, how things interact, or how things program. Oh, look at that. Good, good work, yeah, Pete. Right. But how many projects can you get out of a Well, Jessica, that's a really good question. Thanks for asking. So our paper circuits kit, which is our small guy here, this guy, 25 bucks. This has 30 LEDs in it. Um, we have five different colors, blue, green, white, red, and color changing, which is just, 
the ad power to slowly change its color, which is a little pizzazz, uh, which I always like. It has 16 feet of tape in it. And I usually say one to two feet per project um, that a student makes. Something like uh, the gingerbread guy here probably only uses six inches of tape. Um, but the typically the limiting factor on here for activities um, is the, we have 10 batteries in here. So one battery per project, you can make 10 batteries. Uh, and typically I always tell people that you're gonna end up with leftover supplies. And so if you wanna keep doing this, just get more batteries. They're just the, the inexpensive coin cell batteries you can get from so many places, so many places if you have extra materials. Because typically uh, we overload people <laughs> with, with LEDs in our projects because we wanna make sure people have a wide enough variety of colors and a wide enough amount. Um, so you probably will have a bunch of leftover LEDs you can use. Cause I think typically most of our projects use one to two LEDs, something like this uh, holiday tree here uses four, which is a lot for a paper circus project. So you say you make your 10 projects, 20 LEDs, you have 10 left over. Um, so yeah, you can totally do that. And so I, yeah, 10 uh, or get some extra batteries. You could probably make 15 <laughs> off of it with there, which makes it pretty inexpensive per per activity to add on to. And the nice part is too, if you want to say, make a project and you realize, you know what? I really hate this project I've made. Take the LEDs off until you break those legs, which if you, you know, bend them back and forth like an old school metal coat hanger, um, it will snap. It's a, it's a solid uh, wire, but you, I have people who take parts off and reuse them, especially for home things. Uh, if you're done with an activity. That's the tree over there. I pulled those off a different tree. Oh, you, you pulled, he you pulled these, uh, these LEDs off of a different you tree. Get them off a couple times at least. Oh, we, we try to, when we do documentation, we make the same project three or four times once to make it. Then usually a second time, just to make sure we did it right the first time. And then a couple more for documentation. So I guess, yeah, sometimes our LEDs get used multiple times by the, by the fourth project, <laughs> just because we end up using a lot of them. Um, not that we don't have insane amounts of LEDs uh, around, but the Lego-based stuff I enjoy just because it's that little bit higher level, but forces the kids to um, have to know how things actually work together. One of the biggest pet peeves I have is a, not Snap Circuits because uh, Snap Circuits is a very similar esque form. You have to put things together in the right way, or, or otherwise it doesn't work. Which is why I like Snap Circuits as a nice base level starter thing. But there've been a few products over the years in the home or classroom STEM market where it really rely really heavily on magnets to snap things together. And a lot of it's just snap, snap, snap thing, thing works. And I did that in my classroom once and my kids, kids were having fun. I'm like, okay, students, why are these things working together? And they're like, oh, well, it's the magnets are making it work. No, the magnets just made it so easy that it went past the point of learning. <laughs> that it's just, it's, I, I, I like to do cooking analogies, especially with adults, because they get it. It's the difference between saying, here, here's a microwave dinner, microwave it. You've learned how to cook versus here are ingredients, well, put them together. A lot of people believe that. <laughs> and again, uh, sometimes I microwave myself something up. I, I have a toddler at home, so sometimes you microwave up things for him. Uh, but then again, my wife and I also cook and make things from scratch. But even then, like, yes. I don't mill my own flour, but I will buy a bag of flour. There's, you know, the certain level where you've done just enough that you've accomplished something, but not so little that it's too easy and not so much that you're overwhelmed. It's a, it's the, the three porridge approach. Yeah. <laughs> this project awesome. was just right for learning. Um, and that's, that's always a tough one. Cause there's some really fun things out there that masquerade as STEM activities. Um, dr uh, drones were really big a couple of years ago at teaching events drones kids learn how to use drones i'm like well those are just quadcopters all the lesson plans activities like fly this thing around i'm like that that's a remote controlled copter it, yes it, we have a drone uh and i have to say it's fun the kids enjoy it but there's not particularly a lot of learning that goes on with that there's a few things like you can make it learning but it's really tough to bring the learning in that's past the fun of it and um, not that quadcopters aren't fun, I will attest, they are very fun to zip around, um, but you have to it's have a learning It's just a more component. complicated remote control car. Th thank you. And most of them are, yeah, we laugh because there's a few other things out there just like, there's just an RC thing with some learning thrown on the side that you're masquerading as a STEM product. And I, you know what, I, I, I enjoy my fun things as well, but they're, for a classroom environment, or a home learning environment or an after school. I, that's, yeah. You have to have that in there, if, especially if you're trying to bring something in and gain the kids interested in, in education, the learning and, component to it. Yeah, and these types of activities can help get them to that next level. 
Exactly. And plus, I, I like a brick environment because um, there are many brick environments these days, not just certain name brands, uh, because everyone knows how to use this. Uh, Snap yes. Circuits is great because everyone knows how to do it. Uh, squishy Circuits with conductive dough, everyone knows how to use Play-Doh. By the time you're like four, you've played with Play-Doh for dozens and dozens and dozens of hours. My toddler I've who's never three, heard of Squishy Circuits. Oh, squishy Circuits, uh, it's Matthew out of Minneapolis. Um, it is just conductive dough and most regular Play-Dohs are, um, are conductive, but the conductive dough he has is that extra little bit of extra conductivity, but you're using it to run power through as opposed to say conductive tape. Um, it's a very great early learning activity for doing circuitry at a pretty inexpensive price point. Um, I used to make my own conductive dough 10 years ago because <laughs> I, I had no money as a teacher, uh, but he has directions as well on his website for um, definitely check making out. your own dough. It's good stuff. Um, Joshua? Uh, Erica has yes. a question, origami versus paper circuits. Are they so, similar except one is teaching origami? No, so I, we call it origami circuits because everyone thinks anything three-dimensional paper craft, people just default to calling it origami, which <laughs> as a stickler for words, um, it, it pains me to do that. But most people are like, oh yeah, three-dimensional paper craft of any type is origami. Eh, eh. The Japanese would would probably uh, but you disagree. disapprove of the label. <laughs> I lived in Japan for five years. Those small students spent a lot of time folding paper as a classroom activity, mm -hmm. as a thing that they would do in class and they, they were really good at it. I was not as a, as a adult going to Japan, uh, learning how to do that with you know, fourth and fifth graders. But uh, so origami circuits was paper circuits. Um, the origami circuits come with the uh, vib self-sticking vibrating motors and less LEDs. Whereas the paper circuits kit comes with a bunch of LEDs, far more LEDs and uh, no vibrating motors basically oh, okay so basically that. yeah it, you swap out the leds for motors uh or or a good chunk of the leds for motors just because uh they cost far more than leds do those self-sticking motors but the activities we have are for those are more complicated i would say the origami circuits is if you have more competent paper crafty students at a little bit higher age level or adults because you can do three-dimensional things like this or this and um, then Jessica is asking if, do you offer in the lesson plans the how circuits yes. for, for those of us who know nothing about electronics? <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, especially for paper circuits, which is why that's my go-to. We have uh, five different standalone, like basic circuitry lessons where you could just take the paper circuits kit. We actually developed it really for um, distance learning last year. We had a lot of schools and after school programs, like we need to send things home with kids that are learning component, like, well, we'll just make these nicer, the ones we had. So we have some nice lessons on those, everything from a, a simple circuit to a parallel circuit to making fun paper-based switches. Um, those are all up there on our website for under the paper circuits activity area, which is really, really handy. And Karen, who is kicking around here doing video work, she's putting together a series of six videos on the basics of electronics that are very great beginner videos for people who are starting out, whether you're an adult or a student, nice little videos like, how does this thing work? And why is it working? Here's a nice, nice video overview of those. So that's what she's, she's working on in our, our video production room over there right now. Um, we'll be posting those shortly, but uh, again, always putting out new things. Um, and now we're working on uh, as well. We're our next, uh, next quarter. So January, once the holidays are over, we're spending a lot of effort putting all of our different uh, paper circuits, especially paper circuits activities into some very nice uh, themed eBooks, more or less coalescing a bunch of different individual things into one nice little downloadable PDF to and help Jessica with people. Jessica is very excited for the videos too. <laughs> and li li actually literally for people like Jessica, like, hey, where's all the beginning, the first five beginning lessons with a bit of extra info in one spot? Here's this one PDF, download it. Here are links to those videos on YouTube that go with it. Um, because we're getting people like Jessica asking those things uh, more and more these days. So we try to, people ask us for something. We typically listen because if they took the effort to ask, it must be important. <laughs> well, this is excellent. I, I, I was really hoping that today's session would help me choose between those three. And instead of helping me pare down my list, my list is larger. <laughs> well, we like to have a wide range of things. A lot of our, our kits use similar components. Like the self-sticking vibrating motor in our uh, origami kit is the same motor we use in our, 
our solar bug kit. And the same LEDs we use across the board for things. These LEDs are actually the exact same LEDs with the exact same LED manufacturer as the ones in our paper circuits kit. So we have a lot of cross-pollination of materials, but we like to make sure that we have things separated out enough so that if you are a paper crafty person or have a very specific interest, that there is a, a, a very specific kit for you without getting too complicated, uh, but so that it can meet those different interests because everyone has an interest and uh, we want to make sure that we're getting them the right materials for that. Um, oh, uh, another question. How long is it taking people to get their order once they place it? Well, I, I know from Schiller, uh, in general, across the U.S. right now, uh, the biggest issue with anything is just mail is taking forever. It's a big discussion I have with my warehouse manager in our, in our other uh, area. We just, uh, mail is taking forever to go anywhere these days. Um, so we're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We ship things out for ourselves or for Schiller. Um, it, it depends. From here to Chicago, it takes one day. Although I'll say this, going three miles down the road here in Wisconsin once took a week and a half earlier this year for some We've weird reason. We've had that experience too. I, I typically say from like us to the East Coast and say down to Texas, it's that like three day, maybe four day by USPS. Um, not to say the West Coast, which apparently is the furthest place on the planet um, from Milwaukee, it takes like four to five days to get out there, uh, which has just been, it has been so frustrating on our part because... Uh, Nothing is worse than sending something out to a school or to a parent or to a, a scout leader and it doesn't show up on time. And like, we get things out the door instantly. Right. Um, and, then, and yeah. And then it's a crapshoot. <laughs> it, it, it is. It's really. Uh, Another, yeah. it's, it's the promise time or double or 10 times the promise time of, of you know, that the USPS says, oh, it'll take this long to arrive. Yeah, and, then and Erica has a question also, uh, would love your perspective on kits and projects to start with for a seven-year-old. So a seven-year-old, the biggest thing with any kit, I, I think ages 10 and up, all of our kids say ages 10 and up on the box, because I've just found the age 10 is a very magical age level where students apparently have the right cognitive skills for reading directions and direction following and the dexterity as well with their hands to do activities. Now that's not to say seven, seven eight or nine year old kid would also have a really great time making our fun Gene the gingerbread man, but they're gonna need adult supervision on that because it is a big dexterity and direction following thing. Cause I, I have some very, very, very bright kids who do activities that are boosts and whatnot. But I say, if the kids are below age 10, they need to have an adult because I know I'll be sitting there like helping them heavily just because they just don't have that eye-hand coordination that older kids just get naturally. And it's an interesting thing to watch. Different groups of kids sit down, especially a wide range of kids for the same family. We might have a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, and an 11-year-old in the family come and sit down. And they're all clearly doing the same activities at home have a lot of the same background knowledge, but just that bit of dexterity difference, a little bit of age level difference, how much it changes what they need help with or now, what things they, they have difficulty with. How about the bug for a seven-year-old? Would that oh, be a good so one too? Bug, paper circuits are two things that are very straightforward because the bug is is very simple. Uh, uh, it is a very simple product. I'm thinking a seven-year-old would love that. <laughs> and paper circuits are great because again, there's that coloring component in there as well. Mm -hmm. So you, I, going back to Gene, cause he's the thing I can grab right in front of me here. On the back side, there's not a whole lot of circuitry. You can help them out with that very easily, but you got the cutting and the direction, which will take up the bulk of probably their time on it. And when they're done, they can still take ownership because they help do this part but they did everything else themselves. When I did um, uh, soldering with my students, um, there were a few kids in my eighth grade class who I knew could not solder because of just the way they were, uh, that I would make sure that we helped them. But still, even though we were just doing that little 30 seconds of soldering, I was doing a little bit more of it than they were. They were still doing the other 98% of the work for everything else in the project. So for them, they're like, no, that's, that's cool. You're just, you're helping me out with this little aspect. The bulk of it is still me which again, that ownership. And there's that little, that weird point where too much adult help, it suddenly becomes the adult project as opposed to becoming yes. the kid's project. And That's, we've all been there. And as, yeah, a, as oh, a parent. I, I'm always cautioning against that <laughs> in our sessions. Like 
Resist the temptation to jump in unless it's absolutely necessary. Which is why the paper circuits that extra bit of coloring and the cutting that go with it gives, I'm not saying it's not busy work because it is meaningful work to them. And it's still stuff that they can all accomplish on their own, be it with a pair of little safety scissors or, or some markers or crayons, they, they've got it. But you have to make, yeah, have to make sure that enough of it is on them. So paper circuits and the solar bug, those are really, really straightforward and easy. And the other thing too, with the younger age levels, we always see 10 and up as well, because there are lithium, lithium coin cell batteries. That's what they call them. Uh, lithium coin batteries. Even says on here, a little picture of parents keeping things away from children on this battery uh, etched on there. You um, would not want that to fall into little hands that would eat it. Little hands, yes. Uh, an, or animal mouths. Uh, having a pet with swallow these would be equally bad. Uh, we have an office dog here who loves to retrieve things. And so we have to be very careful about batteries in the front half of our, of our office warehouse here because he will retrieve things off the floor and bring them to you because he is a retriever. It's what he was built for. Excellent um, note of but caution. This, this is the big one. Everything else, these LEDs, they're large. I mean, if someone's trying to chew on that, eh, very uncomfortable. Um, but these batteries are the number one issue that we just warn people about. There's warnings all over the stuff we have, but that's why I say 10 and up. Um, and then again, a parent at home with a child or a grandparent at a kitchen table with a child is much different than say a, an educator in a classroom with 20 kids oh, or a absolutely. scout leader with, with a room full of, of uh, young people doing something. So if you can do a one-on-one -on -one hands-on and you know that's going to be not a, a non-issue, go for it. But these are the biggest warning aspect there. Everything else, I mean, our, our solar bug here has googly eyes on the bottom, just self-sticking uh, little googly eyes, uh, which had a nice little rattle effect. But these are standard googly eyes. And you, any seven-year-old has probably used these a hundred times before because mm -hmm. everything is better with googly eyes, as we found. <laughs> they give a nice smooth surface for the bug to, to move along little casters, but also a nice little rattle effect because I like when things to make sound in addition to motion. Um, again, another, another sensory perception thing. You can feel it vibrate. You can hear it rattle. You can see it move. Uh, it's just another then, little thing. <laughs> and then Josh, a final thought, final recommendation for parents teaching science at home. Um, my biggest recommendation is for any parent who wants to do any kind of science with the kids, uh, kids, you know your kids, you know what they're into, find something that at least has a connection to what they're into or has something like that goes for it. Even if it's a paper craft, you know, your kids are into uh, rocket ships or into sci-fi stuff, make, make a rocket ship that lights up, at least have something that goes there. Cause we have several versions of this. This is one of my favorite peak projects because we have several different versions of the same basic design, but we try to do some pop culture things too, but just find that thing they're into and then connect it with a little bit of science. The same thing with any arts and crafts thing, just to bring in the crafts with it as well um, so they can show it off and be proud of that thing that they've done. And that I just find that brings that biggest motivating factor for the kids into play. Um, if the kids are into bugs, you can't go wrong with solar bugs. I like bugs and I'm almost 40 because they're fun. Um, yeah. that, but that's that moving a, aspect is great. <laughs> well, I, and again, if they're into, they wanna do some kind of programming aspect, Go with simple programming. There's so many great simple, pro whether it's from us or from somebody different, there are many different simple programming things out there. If you got a, a, a five or six year old or seven year old who really is into Play-Doh still, go with the Squishy Circuit stuff. I cannot recommend enough Matthews and SquishyCircuits.com, their stuff, um, just because it's a nice kinesthetic thing that's different. But then again, you get a kid who is eight or nine or 10, they're past the Play-Doh phase. Again, it's just knowing your kid and where it is because I find so many STEM products in general from so many companies, they have a very limited age factor. Like there's a certain time and place in the kid's development in their, in their interest, in their, their brain cycle where the thing makes sense. Like snap circuits for like sixth graders worked fine, but as soon as they hit towards the end of their sixth grade year, those were, no, they, they were too old for those. And that's always a hard one finding that nice spot in there because you know it only lasts for so long, um, mm -hmm. which is why we try like the paper circuits have a wide range of things. Or, or the Lego based stuff, wide range of things, just so you can pad that out further and further and further, add a bit more complexity. But yeah, it's a, it's a tough one with kids because they just, they learn so quickly. And when they, especially when they get into it, then they learn really, really fast. And the stuff you have just like anybody in a hobby. And then, it, it, so some of your kits, the paper circuits, the crazy circuits, the solar science, 
those are featured in our Black Friday flyer, but we Ooh. have tons more of your resources available, you know, right through Schiller Learning. And then folks will be able to, you know, go to your site and get all of these wonderful resources, all of the different directions for being able to create those projects. And then we're really excited about your um, resources that you are going to be. Um, Amanda, can, can you put a link in there for the brown dog um, tagged items? Um, yeah. Awesome, and, thank you. And if people really like our stuff out there and you think, hey, these guys are, are not too shabby, um, we always recommend people following us on Twitter if you're a Twitter person or a Facebook person. Um, oh. I'm neither, but we, we, we force ourselves to do that so much. So whenever we're making up new projects or activities, we tend to just announce them on the social media platforms. Like Pete oh, takes a video clip with a link like, hey, look, here's your gingerbread man. Um, here's this, a quick little, you know, just as a like new projects that we announce things because otherwise, we're posting a new project almost daily this time of year because we have so many, so many in the pipeline um, for a lot of these holiday things. They're pretty, pretty quick and easy for us to put okay. together. Awesome. But, well, I will be following you on social media then. <laughs> Thanks. We also we also do giveaways too on on social media, especially Twitter. Thanks, Pete, for for flashing that on screen. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. He's just awesome. over there like pushing buttons and drinking coffee. Um, <laughs> cool beans. Uh, I do like my cool beans. Thanks, Pete. Um, but that's. We try to do that and we try to put out new resources because really for us, the more content we put out there, the more projects that might resonate with a, a student or an adult yeah. learner even. I have adults who do Lego-based stuff because adults doing Lego is is a big thing these days. I'm not yeah. above it myself, <laughs> building a That's big project. Awesome. Um, but yeah, so we try to put out new resources as much as possible. And a big push this next spring here to do the, the eBooks in a way that make it a little easier for people to just focus in on one area of things. Since our amount of resources we have are getting a bit unwieldy in our documentation system, we just have and, so many. And then we will also put that link if you are watching the replay, there'll be a link down below in the comments on the video. Josh, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. I'm really excited for the resources and yeah, we look forward to doing these with my kids who are going to be totally surprised because they don't watch any of my videos. <laughs> well, I, if, I would tell people, if you have questions or like have a project idea, like, hey, I got this thing. Can I do X, Y, Z with it? Shoot us an email. I, I kid you oh, not. So many, so many things like a, like the stocking we have over here. I don't think we're actually going to make a, a documentation too heavily on the adding paper circuits to a stocking because it's just the same thing we're doing all over anyway um but oh, we'll let people like how but, about if someone has oh you know my child is interested in xyz can they send you project ideas yes we we frequently get those from from people like hey we have this thing upcoming or a librarian who asked us to have more um non-denominational just generic holiday things which is why we're actually putting up so many of these very uh winter just open winter things because Librarian New Jersey was like, hey, we love these two or three things you do. Can you do more? We're like, you know what? They're on our big whiteboard already. Let's How about literature-based projects? Like if there's a certain book that you could have. We, we, we do a, try to make things that are close but aren't copyright infringing too much uh, on okay, things. Okay, gotcha. That's, that, that's the biggest thing for us because although we don't sell them, last thing I want to do is to have to deal with legal issues. However, yes. that being said- Things in public domain. Yes. Um, and in general, we do try to mm -hmm. at least make enough projects out there. We're like, hey, I want to make a really cool, say Star Wars, like fun greeting card. Make a couple of paper circus projects, doing your own thing. You can do it yourself uh, or get yourself there. <laughs> which is right. like do, do your own uh, copyrighted things galore uh but uh yeah we just uh, try to make sure that we are we are being good on our end as much as well, possible i i may be in touch with some recommendations or requests then <laughs> and uh somebody recommended jessica said make a book that children could write their own stories with doing your own like write your own storybook with paper circuits is actually a popular activity that um 
people are doing for ages of adding some fun lights to things, having a kid write a story with say things that light up or a light up aspect to it. And then say adding some drawing with some light up components to it is a very appropriate student led activity because if I write a story about a, a dragonfly and a uh, lightning bug that become friends and Pete over here writes a story about um, wizards, I assume Pete would write a story about wizards. I don't know. Wizards who are into 1990s punk music. Electric, Electric wizards. There we go. Um, again, we could each write our own story and do our own artwork um, and then add those to it after we've done a couple of very simple projects. So uh, we try to, yeah, because there are a lot of things we do we kind of want to do that, but would be really weirdly specific, which is the the hard part. And a lot of these things are do a couple of these guys, then you can do your own book galore without my help, because uh, it's surprising how quickly kids pick up the paper circuits. It's just A to B for connections, and then then they're, they're the kids are smart. <laughs> kids kids are way smarter than we ever give them credit for. Um, Absolutely. So uh, yeah, give them the creative yeah. tools on hand, and they'll do their own thing and take it as far as they want to. Uh, which is sometimes way too far, way further than I would ever take a project. Uh, but that's what well, a good and, hobby and is. And that's what we want. We want them to, you know, to grab that interest and take off with it and do amazing things, uh, you know, beyond what we even envision for them. Um, and I think your products are definitely going to help get them there. So thanks again for joining us. And um, we will be back next week for Tuesdays at two with some winter themed shelf activities. And then we will be on winter break for a few weeks. Um, and we will send out a schedule for that. So you know, look for more things coming on the Schiller Learning website for Brown Dog Gadgets as well. And Joshua, thank you to you and your team, all of your helpers making it possible um, behind the scenes there. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.